Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our FPCI Ambassadorial Lecture in cooperation with the Delegation of the European Union to Indonesia. My name is Ray, and I will be the moderator for today's event. I hope all of you are doing well and healthy during these turbulent times. Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia has the pleasure to once again conduct this lecture series throughout 2021. And today we have here with us His Excellency, Ambassador Vincent Piquet, the Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Welcome, Ambassador. Today, we are also joined by students from four universities across Indonesia. We have Pinus University in Jakarta, Universitas Hasanuddin in Makassar, Universitas Islam Indonesia in Yogyakarta, and Universitas General Sudirman in Purwokerto. Welcome everybody, and also thank you to our participants for tuning in in our YouTube channel. I'm very excited, and I hope you do too, because it's not every day that you university students can get the chance to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue discussions with the ambassador. So I'm sure that we will have a great discussion today. Ladies and gentlemen, this ambassador lecture series aims to discuss various aspects of the bilateral relations between Indonesia and the European Union, especially during this unprecedented time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we will have an update from the European Union on COVID-19 vaccines, recovery, and international corporations. Before we start, don't forget to share your moments with us from this lecture by tagging at FPC Indo and at uni underscore Europa on your social media post. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let us now begin today's discussion. His Excellency Ambassador Vincent Piquet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ray, for the introduction and uh, and for the welcome to, um, once again, a, a talk by me to the um, students um, um, connected with FPCI, uh, the fantastically vibrant uh, network of uh, internationally minded and international relations students uh, throughout um, Indonesia. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you uh, once more um, today. And uh, after what I found were very, very nice and interesting lectures and discussions indeed um, uh, that uh, we had uh, uh, last, uh, last year. Uh, I also would like to um, uh, recall uh, the very interesting experience uh, I had and uh, with me, I'm sure many, many others of uh, participating um, as an um, uh, in the audience of the uh, the global town hall that um, uh, Dr. Dina Patel, um, together with think tanks uh, around the globe, organized um, uh, late last year. It, it was a fantastic uh, moment of uh, um, almost 24 hours non-stop dialogue um, uh, amongst uh, global audiences and thought leaders and uh, politicians um, <clears throat> about um, the matters that the world faces um, uh, right now, um, wherever you are, uh, whether it's Europe, um, uh, the region I'm from, uh, or whether it's Asia, or indeed uh, this, this great country, uh, Indonesia. So all in all, uh, last year's experience gave me um, uh, the wish to uh, uh, to continue uh, with uh, FPCI on this uh, on this uh, series of, uh, of of dialogues, and I do hope indeed that uh, we will have a chance to uh, to have a good discussion uh, together. And I look forward to to hearing your perceptions, your questions, of course, your comments, and uh, so that we can learn from from one another. Um, I've been in uh, Indonesia now for a good year and a half. Um, uh, of course, it's not a typical um, uh, posting um, uh, of the past uh, 11 uh, months or so, uh, very atypical, uh, in fact. And um, uh, with all sorts of work uh, that uh, uh, myself, my colleagues in the uh, EU delegation, but also uh, the ambassadors um, in the uh, embassies of the uh, EU member states in Jakarta and their staffs, uh, all sorts of atypical work that you've been faced with and had to <clears throat> take to um, uh, come to, to terms with. 
and all of it has to do with uh, with the the pandemic and uh, with the need uh, to give the best possible response uh, as diplomatic missions uh, from the EU um, uh, to it locally um, for our communities, uh, for uh, our staffs, but also uh, very particularly, I should uh, like to stress, uh, for the sake of our uh, attachment uh, to Indonesia, a, a very close partner uh, of the European Union here in Southeast Asia. Um, we've done um, an awful lot um, in many respects. I will come to some of these aspects in the course of my, my talk. Um, and um, it's been, of course, an, a very exciting uh, time. Um, at times fatiguing, <laughs> I can tell you that as well. Um, but that's all part of the, um, uh, part of the job. Um, as this is the start of the year 2021. Um, <clears throat> of course, start by expressing my condolences uh, to um, the Indonesian people um, uh, for the, uh, the many victims caused by uh, the plane crash in uh, early this month on the 9th um, by the landslides um, uh, in West Java and by the uh, uh, two earthquakes in um, uh, West Sulawesi. Uh, many people killed, many people injured, uh, much material damage. And um, um, we, as EU, uh, and then uh, speaking, I'm saying not just on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of the ambassadors of the member states in Jakarta, uh, we express our sympathy. We have uh, written condolence letters to the foreign minister, uh, to the governor, uh, governors of, um, of the uh, provinces concerned, and also our leaders uh, from Europe um, wrote letters to, uh, uh, to President Jokowi. Um, it was a bad start of the year uh, for many Indonesian families and um, um, but I hope that uh, in the talk uh, today and in the discussion, we can look also a little bit at a, a glimmer of hope, a ray of hope um, uh, that is uh, visible on the, on the horizon um, in the shape of the, um, uh, the gradual um, uh, uh, control that uh, countries in, in Indonesia uh, are expected to be bringing uh, to the pandemic um, with treatments, of course, but also with the uh, very gradual rollout of the, um, of the vaccination program. Um, a ray of hope um, 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 the, uh, is visible on the horizon, I, I'd say. Um, it's not yet within reach, we're not there yet, but it does give, give us uh, a lot of courage to to uh, to carry on. Um, the uh, EU's relations with um, uh, Indonesia are good, are strong. Uh, we have a bilateral agreement um, to give shape to that. That's called the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, and so that uh, ties us together uh, on a totally voluntary basis between the two sides um, for. Um, cooperation towards shared interests, um, mutual interests uh, uh, on matters that uh, uh, go from the political sphere uh, to the economy, to trade uh, and to uh, the many policy fields uh, that uh, we wish to cooperate in. And then you have uh, areas related to the trade agenda like customs, uh, like intellectual property, like uh, the um, uh, um, geographic uh, indications uh, of products, uh, but also very large policy fields like transport, like environment, the climate um, and uh, research and education. Um, so that is our um, normal work and we will um, uh, we'll be taking these areas forward in the course of this year 
I'll mention a little bit of that um, towards the close of, uh, of my talk. But I'll start with, um, with um, the pandemic, with COVID, and uh, with the COVID response and with um, the vaccines. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have, we believe, um, uh, reason to be um, slightly optimistic about uh, uh, the <coughs> course of developments uh, uh, in, um, in 2021. Um, the vaccination policies uh, have come underway um, after you know, very, very hard work in the preceding year for the development of vaccines and for their initial production. And um, we now uh, are busy both in Europe and, uh, and here in Indonesia uh, with the rollout of the vaccination program. We do that, of course, um, Indonesia as well as us uh, against the backdrop of, um, of uh, very high numbers in, of infections. Um, uh, that's the case across Europe as well, um, with some variations between member states, but um, uh, not too, so much. Um, we have um, a rise in deaths caused by uh, the virus. And um, of course, we are very concerned about the emergence of, uh, of new va variants of the virus and uh, variants that uh, are said to be uh, more infectious and uh, potentially more lethal. Uh, so, in other words, even though we have a little bit of an encouragement from uh, the vaccine program, there's absolutely no room for complacency. Our, our hospitals in many European countries are overburdened, um, sometimes full. Um, uh, the hospital capacity um, is very limited. And of course, there's a, a major impact of the, um, the pandemic on uh, the economy and on the lives of individual citizens who are on occasion uh, uh, out of a job uh, because of the, uh, the crisis or uh, working half time or less. Um, schools are sometimes closed. Uh, the kids can't go um, and do their normal learning um, uh, in, uh, in the way they they'd like. Um, so there is a major, major impact on, um, on society. Now, ever since um, last uh, year, February, um, when the crisis uh, first struck, um, the EU has, of course, been uh, helping where it can uh, to um, uh, combat uh, the, the pandemic and to um, lessen the impact of it uh, on, uh, on the citizens and on the member states, uh, social economic impact uh, um, in particular. Um, we've spent uh, a lot of money uh, from the EU budget uh, for um, supporting companies uh, to keep uh, workers on their um, uh, pay bill and their salary bill. Uh, continue to pay salaries um, so that they can bridge uh, the, um, the pandemic uh, before uh, the recovery um, uh, kicks in. Um, we've given a lot of subsidies to companies as well, particularly in sectors that were particularly hit um, <clears throat> by the pandemic. And um, of course, in very particular um, terms, you're talking about uh, the transport sector, aviation, also train transport, and the fantastic uh, fast, um, fast uh, rail uh, network that Europe has um, badly hit. And, um, and of course, the services sector, where very especially uh, the um, hospitality industry, the restaurants, the coffee bars, and the, uh, uh, the hotels. Uh, were very badly affected. And that, of course, uh, requires a, a, a response. Um, the uh, uh, EU um, was faced with a moment of uh, confusion and crisis right at the start, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but I do believe that um, we got our act together 
relatively quickly and um, managed to um, um, uh, garner a uh, large degree of unity and, um, and commonality of purpose uh, amongst all 27 member states. And that unity of purpose and that united front, if you like, uh, we've also seen in, in the area of the uh, vaccine um, policy. Um, I'll give you one or, one or two uh, very good examples of that. Um, first of all, um, the, um, the way we are procuring uh, vaccines is unique uh, for the EU, never done before. Uh, public health in the EU treaty is a matter for the member states. Uh, it's their task to look after the well-being and health uh, and health care for the citizens. Nevertheless, um, we, the member states um, opted for procuring vaccines together in one go, uh, handled by the European Commission. Um, why? Um, uh, for a very simple reason that it was felt uh, that um, by working together, we could uh, have better uh, supply lines open, more diversity of supply, and uh, hedge our risks uh, better um, with the financial capacity of all the member states together. Uh, we managed to place um, what is called advance purchase agreements uh, for a total of 2.3 billion uh, vaccine doses. Now, that is much more than uh, the EU will need on its own uh, territory <coughs> for um, the foreseeable future. Uh, but the good thing about it was, and that was the main reason for uh, giving um, that model uh, a go, was that by placing that large an order uh, amongst uh, a various um, a series of companies uh, manufacturing um, uh, vaccines in Europe and, and, and outside, we gave these companies an in incentive to invest in the research and in the development and finalization of the vaccines. So by placing a big order, uh, we incentivized these companies and we helped um, what has been the fastest ever production of a vaccine uh, in, in human, human history. Normally it takes 10 years to get a product or on the shelves. Uh, in this um, case, it was uh, done within a year. Um, so that has been a, a major, major uh, success in many respects um, in terms of the um, uh, production of uh, the vaccines and uh, the uh, uh, procurement of them for, uh, for member states. Now, this is not the end of the story, evidently, because buying vaccine is, uh, is one thing and actually delivering it to uh, your population, to your citizens, in all uh, corners of, um, of your country or your, in our case, our, uh, our continent, um, is, is, is a totally different thing. So the other task we are now um, dealing with is ensuring that we have a, um, uh, a, a logistical sy system that is up to the task and that gets the vaccines from wherever they are procured and shipped um, to the, uh, um, the, the clinics, the hospitals, uh, the healthcare centers where they are administered. Um, logistics is one. Uh, complicated by uh, the fact that some vaccines require um, ultra cold uh, transport uh, facilities, minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, complicated by the fact that uh, no country, no region, nobody uh, on earth um, uh, so far has ever had this task of vaccinating your entire population large size of it um, uh, in one go. Uh, typically, of course, vaccination is a very gradual process. Uh, children, babies are vaccinated against the polio, uh, etc. And once you have the system up and running, it's very predictable how it can be managed. Now, 
today we have a different task in Europe, in Indonesia, uh, because of the, the mass, mass scale of this um, uh, vaccination uh, campaign. Um, hospitals, healthcare centers do not always have the uh, necessary equipment or not in the right sort of quantities. So that is a, uh, a, a task we have. Um, uh, the cold storage is an issue and the provision of equipment for um, uh, that cold storage is a, is a task for which we uh, are working together with the uh, producing uh, firms. Now, what is our um, objective? Um, I'll mention two. Uh, first of all, the um, objective that by the end of March of this year, so in a good two months from now, um, all member states, all 27 member states, should have vaccinated uh, at least 80% um, of uh, the health care workers, uh, the social care workers, as well as the persons above the age of 80 years. Uh, so that is <coughs> task one, uh, objective one, uh, that we have for March 2021. And by the second key objective is uh, summer 2021. Uh, summer in, in our terms is uh, somewhere around July, uh, August. Um, that uh, objective that member states should have vaccinated a minimum of 70% of the adult population. So that is the big bulk of um, the target group that we will be facing, people from 18 um, up to um, 80. <coughs> so, um, this is what uh, the member states have agreed only very recently in the, in the European Council um, with the heads of state and, and um, heads of um, government. Now, equitability is, is key uh, in this. Make sure that um, all citizens, regardless of their income or social status um, uh, or which other um, distinguishing factor ever um, have uh, access to the vaccines and will get a chance to be vaccinated. Um, it's important to keep track of what we do, uh, which is another uh, big challenge uh, we have. Uh, of course, classically, we have the, uh, like you know, probably uh, the yellow booklet uh, designed by the World Health Organization, uh, your vaccine passport uh, that I take um, uh, took from, from Europe when I came out uh, for my posting here. Um, that is one, of course, tool. Uh, but in uh, the current um, situation, it is also felt uh, that there is need, uh, necess uh, necessity of, of having a digital uh, record of um, who is vaccinated and who is not. Um, some people find that a little bit scary uh, because uh, it is seen as a risk for the pri privacy and for medical secrecy. At the same time, uh, while that is a, of course, a very true uh, concern that we as policymakers and, and as administrators have to um, respect, um, at the same time, there is a need uh, in the current uh, uh, pandemic situation to have a good overview of where the gaps in your vaccination uh, system exist, whether it's on a social um, uh, parameters or whether it's, it's regional differences uh, or urban versus uh, rural, uh, uh, what have you. Uh, so that is a uh, still a bit of a discussion in the EU that will be uh, taking place over the next week, how precisely to do that and how to build in these safeguards for, uh, for the protection of uh, personal and uh, medical uh, data. But the drive is there to have a, a common approach to it in order to make sure that um, the free flow of people between uh, our member states within our internal market uh, can continue.
with, um, without uh, um, unnecessary hindrances. Um, <clears throat> the other big task is, of course, to, um, to deal with the new variants of, of the virus. Um, some of these have also emerged in some European countries, not everybody and not in every part of each of these countries where they did emerge. But uh, what is now uh, may not be the case tomorrow. We have to be ready uh, for the eventuality that uh, these new variants um, um, emerge on, uh, on our continent in a more widespread manner, or whether it's these variants or still others. Uh, so um, the member states have decided uh, to invest a lot in, in testing capacity uh, to deal with um, these, uh, uh, these new variants and to uh, increase um, the capabilities, the equipment, and um, for uh, what is called genome uh, sequencing um, in order to make sure uh, that we can test sufficient numbers of positive cases uh, for uh, the new uh, uh, variants. Um, right now, uh, the number of tests is, uh, for these new variants is, uh, is very low. It's only 1%. And the goal is to uh, raise that uh, to 10% uh, to of the positive uh, test results. So that is a tremendous increase and that should give a good um, uh, um, scientific basis for how the variants um, uh, develop or may develop. So what the EU will be doing, the European Commission in particular, <coughs> is to uh, supply uh, member states with, uh, with equipment for that and, um, and also with uh, uh, strengthening the laboratory network uh, and information exchange between um, member states. I've mentioned um, uh, our internal market, uh, the, um, where uh, there is a free movement of people um, uh, goods, uh, services, and capital. And um, we learned one thing uh, in during the crisis when it struck first in in March, uh, March, April last year. We learned that um, uh, unless we coordinate our policies on uh, the temporary closure of borders or uh, the national borders, but also the, tem the temporary divisions between the regions within countries. Unless we do that in a coordinated fashion, uh, we will cause a, a problems for our internal market. It will be a, a mess, uh, to put it very simply. The trade flows will stop, um, the cross-border uh, traffic will stop, uh, commuters um, from one country to the other, and there are many of them, in fact, um, uh, between Netherlands and Germany, between uh, France and Belgium, uh, between uh, uh, Germany and, and Austria, and so on and so on, also in the Nordic countries. Um, uh, we have to make sure that those um, normal uh, roles uh, that um, the EU has guaranteed for its citizens, that those normal roles, those, nor those normal options and freedoms uh, continue to be uh, protected and can continue to function. Uh, so uh, there will be no blanket travel bans as a result, uh, no suspension of uh, flight connections uh, or land uh, uh, transport connections or, or water connections. Um, uh, but instead, um, we uh, will have a very focused approach with specifying regions that are particularly at risk uh, and um, designating these on the basis of uh, specific parameters as uh, what is called dark red zones um, and making sure that we try to insulate those zones um, uh, and protect other zones which are light red uh, or yellow. Um, from uh, the uh, too much uh, exposure to the risks in those dark red zones. So a very uh, focused and um, fairly sophisticated approach uh, 
to uh, the functioning of our internal market. Um, with, of course, an, in general, a, an encouragement uh, to all citizens to be prudent traveling, uh, to discourage uh, um, uh, non-essential travels, um, and, uh, and basically to recommend that uh, uh, citizens stay more um, at, at home. So internal market uh, preservation of it is a very uh, important task right now. Um, the fourth dimension is, um, is international. I've so far talked predominantly about the EU itself on, on, uh, on the European continent. And uh, that is, of course, for any government, whether it's the uh, EU government and member states, uh, but also for governance, uh, governments in Asia, in, of Indonesia, the first task. You have to take care of your citizens and, and make sure, do everything you can to keep them um, healthy. Um, but uh, it's a fact uh, that this is a pandemic, it's global, um, and with a disease on a global scale, you can't possibly think that you can solve it on your own turf only. Uh, a global disease, a global pandemic requires a global response. And uh, as our uh, the European Commission President um, has uh, said repeatedly, um, nobody is safe until everybody is safe and everybody everywhere. So for that reason, the uh, European Union has um, all along uh, emphasized that we need to work together um, uh, across the globe uh, to get the disease under control and to provide a solution. Um, at the multilateral level, evidently, uh, the WHO um, and uh, similar uh, multilateral bodies, uh, but also uh, on a bilateral uh, basis uh, with the uh, EU uh, cooperating with individual partner countries, partner regions, uh, in order to help those regions face uh, the pandemic and face it off. Now, on that score, I think the EU has done um, what it promised to do. It has delivered a tremendous amount of um, financial help uh, for third countries around the globe, uh, no less than 38 billion uh, euros. And this is important to strike that this is money, this is cash. Um, this is not goods, but this is cash for aid uh, to third countries. It's untied cash. Uh, it's grant money um, uh, for our partners um, abroad and not connected to any particular uh, uh, conditionalities. 38 billion uh, globally. Um, in ASEAN, uh, we have uh, mobilized Within that um, large amount, we have mobilized um, 800 million um, euros um, worth of assistance. And within that 800 euros, million euros, um, Indonesia has been, um, uh, um, is the recipient of, um, of 200 million euros of COVID uh, support. Um, what's in that money? Uh, a couple of different things, but first of all, I should mention <clears throat> a number of projects we are financing um, run by uh, civil society organizations, um, projects for especially helping the young uh, people, the vulnerable people uh, face uh, the disease um, and uh, women uh, as well. Um, not so much in the uh, large urban centers of, uh, of in, in Indonesia, but in the smaller cities, in smaller towns, uh, in Java, in, uh, in Sumatra, in Sulawesi, and, um, uh, and uh, Nusa Tenggara, uh, East and, uh, and, and West. Um, so civil society organizations are, run, uh, have, are running these projects very close to the the grassroots to the end beneficiaries um, and um, uh, in uh, these various places. 
that's uh, one important type of project. Um, the other uh, um, big project is is our um, uh, support to uh, the uh, strengthening the expansion of two hospitals uh, in Indonesia, one in East Java and one in uh, in uh, South Sulawesi. So that's a project uh, that we are financing together with some grant money, uh, together with um, loans from uh, France and from Germany and from their development banks, in fact. So large projects uh, that will help uh, strengthen the infrastructure, the medical infrastructure in um, those localities and will provide a lasting uh, benefit for uh, the uh, citizens of, um, of, uh, of, the, of the regions concerned. Um, cooperated between uh, us, the EU, and uh, the EU member states. Um, uh, we do that a lot. We call it Team Europe. And, um, and we, we do that together in order to make it clear uh, to um, a partner country or uh, Indonesia, but also to the citizens that the EU, um, in all its diversity, it has the same objective and the same solidarity and support uh, for its, uh, its partners outside, um, outside Europe. So that is one uh, important uh, thing we have realized over the past year. <coughs> um, next is vaccines. Um, uh, you, you may have thought when I described that we have placed these, uh, these contracts for uh, these advanced purchase agreements uh, of 2.3 billion um, uh, uh, vaccine doses, uh, you know, with the European Union being uh, 470 million people. Uh, why do you need so many? Um, uh, doses and uh, of course we need for each citizen we need two um, uh, doses so but all by and large we, we might have um, available um, um, a, a reserve of, uh, of a good one uh, billion um, uh, doses um, so uh, and that's what we're thinking of right now um, it's a little bit still looking into the future of course because um, first of all, we need to make sure uh, that we get uh, the vaccines that we've ordered. And there are some stumbling blocks there. You may have read about it even as, as recently as yesterday when um, the EU's uh, Commissioner for Health um, used rather sharp language uh, to one of the uh, vaccine manufacturers about the delays um, that the uh, the vaccine delivery from that particular firm uh, was suffering. So getting that vaccine is, is still uh, a challenge, but we suppose that this is just a startup problem. The second thing is, of course, um, the question, how does the pandemic develop? Um, will, how many vaccines do we actually need? Is the 70% the target uh, that we have for uh, our adult population is that sufficient? Should it be 75 or 80 even? Uh, those are questions to which we don't, I don't certainly have the answers right now. And um, we have to wait and see. But um, it is, it can be anticipated that uh, uh, we will not be needing everything we've ordered. And uh, as our uh, president uh, of the European Commission said yesterday, we will be working, proposing a, a, a system uh, to member states whereby we uh, can share uh, to our partners um, who need them, um, uh, these uh, spare, the surplus of uh, the vaccines. So that is, a, I think, a major step uh, that we can anticipate uh, to take shape uh, in the course of, uh, uh, of this, uh, this year. So that's one important um, uh, statement, I think, of uh, solidarity. The second one I should mention is, um, is the fact that the European Union <coughs> has been um, uh, supporting all along, ever since um, um, uh, the early months of uh, last year, 
a multilateral uh, vehicle, a multilateral fund uh, for vaccine delivery to lower and middle income uh, countries. It's called COVAX. Uh, and you may uh, know it uh, because only recently um, your foreign minister, for a state, for a minister of Vietnam, um, was appointed the coach, one of the co-chair of uh, of the uh, uh, the advanced market mechanism board uh, of that COVAX uh, fund. Um, very important job, I can tell you that. Um, so um, we have um, the EU invested um, uh, 1 billion US dollars, uh, 850 million uh, um, euros uh, in that fund. And that makes us the, the single biggest donor to the COVAX facility. And um, in fact, uh, we are um, very, very close to being uh, the 50% um, donor of all the funds available uh, in COVAX. Now, in a way that, that makes us proud and, it, um, and, and I think rightly so, uh, which shows that we do take solidarity globally seriously. At the same time, of course, one has to observe that uh, the EU being uh, only 8% uh, of the, uh, the world population and our economy being only 20% of the world uh, uh, global economy. Um, it's not natural that we are 50% of the donor uh, to COFAX and it must mean, and it, and it does indeed, that some donors have not been forthcoming enough as yet. And um, so we very much hope that some of that will change with the return to the multilateral system of, uh, of the United States. Uh, President Biden has said he will rejoin uh, the WHO. And uh, we suppose that that also means that um, the United States will be uh, participating um, uh, also in the multilateral facilities that um, are run under the auspices of WHO, such as the, the COVAX uh, um, facility. So um, that is, in other words, um, a big agenda also for this year, a political agenda to some extent to encourage, to uh, promote that all rich countries, all rich economies will uh, donate uh, to uh, COVAX um, uh, at the appropriate level, uh, commensurate or proportionate to their economic power and their stature in, in the world population. COVAX will be the principal tool for getting vaccines uh, to the poor and lower middle income countries in particular, in fact, middle income countries as a whole. So uh, we will stay very much attached uh, to that facility uh, for uh, providing concrete solidarity to uh, uh, these uh, countries that themselves are unable to procure and pay uh, for vaccines. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, so much for uh, the um, response to COVID and, and, uh, and, and to the vaccine question um, in direct terms, so specifically. Um, <clears throat> Um, we have to look beyond the crisis, we have to look beyond the pandemic, and we have to, of course, think, how are we going to get our economies uh, back into shape? How are we going to restart um, the sectors that have been dormant or close to death um, uh, for so many months? Uh, how are we going to get people back into the jobs? Uh, that they used to have or into uh, different jobs. So um, that's the post-COVID um, uh, socioeconomic recovery. Um, <clears throat> major job in Indonesia uh, as much as in, in, in Europe. And um, 
uh, for which I can say that as far as the EU is concerned, um, we will uh, we will have a magnificent package of, uh, of funding available. Um, you may have followed a tiny bit uh, the discussions inside the EU late last year about our budget uh, for the next seven years, seven years of our normal uh, planning uh, period. Um, tough discussions, uh, because money is money, of course, and uh, um, but in the end, uh, the EU uh, member states uh, uh, settled on uh, the largest ever EU budget uh, uh, since the start of the EU, a budget of uh, 1.8 trillion uh, euros. Uh, I personally <laughs> am unable to conceptualize uh, that, that amount of money, but but there you are, 1.8 trillion euros. So the amount in itself is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is unique and unprecedented. And what's also unprecedented is that um, there was a special vehicle uh, agreed uh, whereby the EU uh, would uh, borrow um, on the international capital market um, uh, for funding part of the budget. Um, so of this 1.8 trillion euros, uh, 750 million euros um, are being borrowed uh, by the EU. So multilateralizing, uh, mutualizing debt um, uh, instruments. Now, never been done for before, unprecedented. You won't find it in the uh, in the history books uh, or in the, in the treaty of the EU, but uh, you know um, there was a realization that we needed to do something uh, that go uh, that goes uh, above and beyond uh, the uh, letter and uh, of the of the law, and uh, so this is quite exciting for a European. Um, official who's been with the EU for a while and to, to see this take shape and uh, no doubt it has been able to give us uh, extra power, extra um, financial ammunition for dealing with uh, the terrible economic crisis that uh, uh, the EU saw last year, uh, minus 8%, and uh, could see uh, this year unless we do something uh, both on fighting the pandemic and on restarting uh, the economy. One other thing that is very important to mention is that uh, the EU has decided that uh, this is not just a recovery, um, uh, but this has got to be a green recovery. Um, uh, in other words, um, whatever we do, whatever we fund, it must contribute to green objectives. And, and, and why is that so? Why did we decide that? For two reasons, principally. Um, first of all, um, yes, we have a pandemic, a COVID crisis, uh, but uh, the, the climate crisis is galloping ahead as well, uh, is um, going to be unstoppable unless we do something and do it now, um, uh, the uh, evidence is there, the science has said it, um, the figures show it, uh, the temperature scales sh show it, um, that uh, we will be at a major risk of, uh, uh, or dead certainty rather, of uh, missing the targets um, laid down in the Paris Accord of, uh, five years ago, <clears throat> and we will be uh, warming up uh, globally by three to four degrees centigrade. Now, when that happens, when that were to happen, let's put it like that, then of course we will have a, a tremendous global food, um, uh, environmental, uh, uh, demographic, population and security crisis at our hands. Um, so we need to act now. And secondly, of course, why link recovery with, uh, with, uh, with the green agenda, uh, simply because money is scarce. And um, if you have one euro, you can spend it only once. And, and um, if you have two tasks, then you have to combine these two tasks into that one. 
uh, one euro that you have in your in your pocket. And um, so for us, the recovery has to lead to what we call uh, the Green Deal for the European continent, um, a policy program that uh, will make us gradually, um, but steadily, um, carbon neutral uh, by the year 2050. Um, carbon neutrality, sustainable, circular. Um, 2050 is the end goal. In between, of course, we have successive uh, uh, intermediary goals, uh, starting with 2030, uh, when um, uh, we aim to be cutting our CO2 by 55% compared to 1990. So <clears throat> that's a major uh, task. That is our <clears throat> new contribution for the, uh, uh, the global um, multilateral climate <clears throat> negotiations, which will go ahead in, uh, in Glasgow in this year. Um, so, uh, recovery combined with the green climate agenda. Um, uh, now, here, uh, we're looking for partners. Uh, <clears throat> doing such an again on our own is, uh, is great. Uh, but if you're the only one, then it doesn't mean much. It doesn't amount to much. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, for that reason, we are looking at partnerships across the globe, countries that are doing similar or, or intending to do similar things. Um, looking particularly to the United States, evidently, for obvious reasons, <clears throat> but also looking at Asia, where China has said it will aim at climate um, uh, neutrality. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> a bit later, 2060, compared to our 2050. Japan has said the same. Korea for 2050. Um, and Korea uh, is intending um, something of the same sort around the same time, still to be fixed. Now, Indonesia, where I'm posted, um, is a major, major partner uh, potentially for us. Um, <clears throat> for the reason of the scale of your economy, the scale of your population, um, the wealth of your biodiversity, uh, the uh, tremendous forest uh, capacity, this biggest CO2 sink uh, in the world together with the peat lands that you have. So in other words, Indonesia is for us a priority partner if it comes to the green agenda. And so, so in the course of this year, um, um, I anticipate that the EU leaders will be reaching out a lot uh, to Indonesia uh, in order to uh, realize that partnership. Now here I refer to uh, also to a very good article I, I read yesterday in, in Compass, a magazine written by somebody I think you know very well, uh, Dr. Dino Pati Patel, who made a very strong plea, and I think a convincing plea, um, for uh, Indonesia to also become a climate leader, uh, particularly ahead of the big multilateral climate conference in Glasgow, November this year. So, great article, and I recommend um, everybody uh, to everybody that they uh, they read it. And uh, uh, so, partners, partnering with Indonesia on a progressive um, and gradual, uh, but very determined uh, climate and green growth agenda is for us uh, going to be a key priority. Good, I stop there. It's uh, um, 
a good 50 minutes down the road. So spoken long enough, I think, and I'm very eager to have a little bit of a discussion with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ambassador Finsen. So uh, I think we can all agree that the EU has supported in a lot of ways and not only financially, but also it's with its vaccine development recovery plan, as well as to make sure that the international corporations are in order, are in play uh, in order to combat the pandemic. And thank you, uh, Ambassador, for the mention of the Padinas article, uh, because we have sent uh, the article to our mailing list, so please stay tuned. And now let's go ahead and dive into our questions and answer sessions. I will be taking three questions per batch. We'll be be then answered by Ambassador Fikat before we moving on to the next batch. Um, in this first batch, uh, to ask your questions, you can use the raise hand feature on your Zoom app by clicking participants and then selecting the raise hand on the bottom right. And I will be randomly selecting from those who have raised their hands. And also please state your name and your questions, but please do limit it to one question per person. And for the first batch, we have three um, students already. So the first one is from Universitas Hasanuddin, Anissa Aprilani. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Masai. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for having the time with us in this ambassador lecture. Um, one of my questions will be on how is the European Union is going to handle the incoming, for instance, the incoming international students to the European uh, Union itself. Uh, you've mentioned that EU is targeting a 70% um, vaccination rate by this July. So are we, but the condition is that some students uh, coming outside of European Union, they don't really come from a country that has that uh, high rate of vaccination, right? So will uh, European Union ha will have this sort of special requirement, for instance, or is there going to be a much more lenient approach towards these international students? Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Okay. Thank you, Anissa. And now we're uh, going to take in, uh, the second questions from Venus University, Dixon Novenus. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello. All right. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, My name is Dixon, and I would like to ask to Ambassador Vincent. Speaking in domestic level, how you manage to ensure that vaccine can be distributed to people in member states equally, including local people and refugees? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dixon. And for our last questions in the first batch, we have Belinda Nurfadila from Venus University. Okay. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for the opportunity. I would like to ask, how does the European Union manage to recover from the pandemic and also to lead a great example for achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals? What do you think about the process on the international community handling the fragility that we have at the same time there's a massive global agenda in 2030 thank you yes now the ambassador the floor is yours <clears throat> thank you thank you thank you very much for these uh, interesting questions uh, um, first of all um, the question from Ibu Anissa in Unhas um, foreign students, uh, how do we handle them now? Um, a couple of things one could say. First of all, uh, we have never closed our border for students, uh, even during the depths of the, uh, of the pandemic. We've always said, um, even if normal travelers cannot enter the EU necessarily, um, some categories of people uh, may tra travel to the EU or may enter, and we have always said, students and researchers should be among them. So that is that is one thing we are open to students. Secondly, of course, right now, um, one has to be very uh, prudent, very careful, 
about how and when you travel. Um, that goes for a student, that goes for me, that goes for everybody. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it, um, it means that um, a student, uh, like other travelers, may require uh, may be required to have a, um, a test, uh, PCR or similar, um, before traveling off and, uh, and uh, may have to do a test when, when they land uh, on the European airport. Um, it's not fixed right now, but that's where the thinking seems to be going. Um, secondly, of course, the usual um, uh, medical social protocols like you have here, the three M's, um, uh, masks, mask, um, uh, wash hands and, uh, and distance. And thirdly, if it comes to vaccination, suppose you are a student uh, in um, spending some time at the University of, uh, of Bordeaux or of Prague uh, or, uh, or, or Stockholm, um, and there is a vaccination program, then uh, the principle will as a rule be that everybody who resides uh, on the European territory uh, with um, uh, a, um, a uh, equivalent of a, of a KITAS here in, uh, in Indonesia um, will be treated as exactly the same, uh, in exactly the same way as, uh, as, uh, as permanent residents, uh, uh, EU citizens. Um, that is um, for obvious reason, and that is a medical one, that for a vaccination campaign to be successful, you have to vaccinate everybody who is in your target group, or at least to the same sort of level. And um, so um, that is uh, um, uh, inclusion of, uh, of foreign residents uh, in our uh, vaccination program uh, is very much uh, understood and the basis of uh, how we will be operating uh, this. But follow this very carefully in the coming weeks because there is decision making uh, happening in the EU on, on the, particularly these matters of, uh, of foreigner entry, of foreign entry, whether it's for uh, EU citizens re-entering the EU or, or foreign uh, uh, citizens. And uh, also follow how the vaccine developments go. Whenever you go, of course, the, the, to a university to stay there, speak to the international office at that university, they will know exactly uh, what needs to be done and uh, what you need to take care of uh, at your end. <coughs> now, um, the question from, uh, from Dixon uh, at, uh, at Venus uh, University, how to ensure equal uh, access, equal distribution of, uh, of vaccines within uh, a union of 27 uh, uh, member states and, and countries with different sizes and, and so on. Um, question um, is difficult, um, uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, but um, <clears throat> the starting point is uh, that um, when the European Commission placed these advanced purchase agreements with manufacturing companies. They did so on the basis of, um, of the needs expressed by the member states. And if you totalize the 27 member states, you get to a number. But it means that each and every member state can in principle count on uh, the number that they asked for, for a particular vaccine and, uh, and for a total. Um, so that is one way of making sure uh, that uh, the uh, vaccines are distributed um, equitably and uh, in, in line with the, uh, uh, the normal um, uh, requests uh, um, uh, across, the, across the EU. Uh, secondly, um, uh, within member states, of course, and, um, it's a very much a, a logistical question um, of finding and targeting the people that you need to have, finding all the medical workers, um, medical professions, the social care workers, the workers, the people who work in the, in the home for the homes for the elderly, um, and, uh, and get them vaccinated. Now, this is a, 
um, a, a lot of work, but very doable at the end of the day. And everybody who will wish to be vaccinated will, will get it. Um, most member states will be providing the vaccine free of charge uh, or with you know, some nominal payment. Uh, so money won't be the problem. And uh, certainly everybody um, in the lower income groups will, will get for, for free for sure. Um, so that, I think, is another so guarantee or, uh, uh, for um, getting the vaccines where uh, they, they have to go. Um, and lastly, it's, it's the question of, um, of, um, of citizens' own initiative. Um, not everybody likes being vaccinated, and for whatever reason. Um, um, but uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, the task of governments and of, at all levels and of medical staff and so forth to explain to the people, to, to the patients, why it has to be done and why it is important uh, for your health, but also for the, uh, the health of the, of the people around you, your family, your friends, and your society, your company, uh, your university. So it's, um, uh, in other words, a, a job of explaining, providing information, objective information, um, uh, making clear that it is necessary, uh, being transparent about uh, uh, the reliability, the efficacy, um, side effects, some side, light side, mild side effects have happened, some little fever or something. So that I think um, public awareness raising, explaining provision of reliable information is, is, is crucial to um, an equitable access. <clears throat> and the third question from Belinda, at, also at Venus. Um, you know, um, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I think e the EU has a green history, a green policy history that, that is already pretty, pretty old, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, we've been focusing a lot on this ever since uh, the 1980s, um, basically. So um, uh, we were always a leader in the, the global climate talks and uh, making commitments and, and putting them into practice. And, and we have uh, time and again. Um, so it's, it's not something that has come overnight, in other words. But the second thing is that um, I think the scientific evidence now is more compelling than it has ever been in showing that action is needed now. And more action is needed than we agreed five years ago in, uh, in Paris in 2015. Great agreement, but um, it won't be enough. Um, so, and we have seen on the European continent uh, the effects of climate change and, and uh, in all areas. And we have simply come, the political class has simply come to the conclusion that we have to do it now. Mm -hmm. Why have they say, said so? Because the voter wants it. Um, which group in particular is extremely strong and motivated in pushing uh, the political class? It's the young people. Uh, uh, they have been a major, major force, a major influence in, in shaping and pushing environmental climate policy in, inside Europe. So, um, uh, that, uh, I think, has, um, uh, penny has dropped, in other words, uh, amongst almost everybody um, uh, that we need to do. And the question in Europe is not if we should do it, uh, but how, and how to help uh, those member states who have the, 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 the biggest transition to make. And some of our member states have more coal uh, in their energy mix. And, and coal is a 
sunset energy source. Uh, uh, most fossil fuels are a sunset energy source. So uh, we have to help those member states who have to make that transition from coal uh, to <coughs> renewable. And um, so that's the, the business we're in now of making that happen low domestically on the continent in Europe, but also engaging our international partners to try and convince them to do uh, the same sort of reform towards green growth. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. And now uh, we can move on to the second batch. Now you may use the raise hand feature in order to ask questions for the second batch. And before we take new students, uh, we have one question in the chat box from Nabila Kansa from FPCI uh, Universitas General Sudirman. So talking about the recovery in the time of COVID-19, the digital transformation has been occurred in all education level, including higher education. The educational establishment is also blended in with in-person and online class. However, it may turn into challenges for the international students who want to study in the European Union. They do not only have to deal with the culture shock, but also the learning experience. So her questions, how does the EU, um, so how does the EU maintain the quality of the education uh, during this unprecedented times, as well as EU uh, is the well-known um, place to study? Yes. And for the other students, please use the raise hand feature if you have any questions. If not, then the ambassador can uh, answer the first questions first. All right, um, I didn't get the name of the uh, student who asked, but... Tanza. Tanza. Tanza from uh, Sudirman, University of Sudirman. Well, um, I think I'm, you're raising a very, very good question. Uh, I believe um, uh, how maintain quality of education uh, in telemode, um, uh, <clears throat> of course, the, the question applies to all levels of education, as primary, secondary, and uh, tertiary. Um, but uh, certainly for tertiary, um, of course, um, um, it's a, a an essential question. We students, I mean, I <laughs> I was a student a little, a little while ago, I must say, but but. Students thrive by by debate, by um, contacts with uh, others, by he hearing and discussing um, different uh, uh, points of view, uh, by um, <coughs> group work, uh, uh, doing research together in teams and uh, sometimes in laboratories, um, etc. So it's evident that there is a. Uh, um, something is lost in uh, maybe not the quality of the education of, uh, but certainly in the in the way in the nature of education and and certainly i suppose something is lost in in, in the possibilities to enjoy academic life uh, like like you know we know it in under normal circumstances so i think that that's a real issue uh, that's uh, that's why in europe uh, as well as uh, i've heard the same here there's a lot of talk about um, reopening schools and reopening uh, universities and, and uh, for the sake of the well-being of, um, of the student. Um, um, in front of my uh, residence here, there's a, a vocational school that has been closed ever since March last, last year. Well, the students have been sitting at home ever since March last, uh, March last year. And uh, it is, it's horrible. Um, so um, I think university students in Europe, um, much of the coursework um, is done in telephone. Um, some of the smaller 
um, uh, work is still done in physical mode, uh, but um, it is not that much. And everybody is, of course, hoping that uh, once we get um, sufficient numbers in the population uh, vaccinated, once we reach the, the 70% in the adult population that I mentioned earlier, uh, that we then can reopen um, uh, the universities once again. One bit of caution is, of course, when, as, as many of the um, experts also from WHO have been saying, yes, vaccination is, is a, 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 um, uh, a, a helps to get more safety. Um, the European Commission president von der Leyen, who, as you may know, is by training a medical doctor, is um, um, she, she said um, uh, vaccination helps us create freedom from fear. Uh, and I think that's a very, very true notion. Um, but it is not a 100% uh, foolproof uh, guarantee uh, for safety at the same time. So we will have, even with a vaccinated uh, population, we will have to live with, uh, <clears throat> with the three M's basically. And uh, as for the sake of, uh, of prudence and, and security uh, for yourself and for your, your fellow, fellow, fellow beings. So um, the new normal, uh, I'm afraid, uh, will be one <laughs> that's in all likelihood um, going to be the, the one with a, with, with a mask. Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, earlier, we have um, Rizky Liberty from Venus University. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, um, dear Mr. Ambassador. I would like to ask a question. The, the question is, countries like Poland and Hungary have not been in line with the European Union in the past few years. During this pandemic, when collective stance and cooperation are needed, to combat the pandemic, how does the EU unite its members' countries? Thank you. Ambassador? Oh, well, um, I would say uh, it all comes down to a recognition um, of shared interests, of shared uh, worries, uh, for shared threats, and um, uh, on the one hand, and a recognition of um, uh, that a common uh, or joint response is is better, is faster, is stronger uh, than um, uh, than an individual one. Um, just imagine uh, if this uh, thought experiment, as Einstein would say, um, imagine that in the middle of last year, instead of grouping the vaccine purchases uh, together, um, as we did, if, if all member states had gone their way individually, uh, do you think that we would have had this, this sort of um, uh, access to vaccines that we have created for ourselves? No, uh, I don't think so. Uh, because uh, the, this joint order uh, with a number of firms created a, a demand, uh, it's a guaranteed demand for those companies that made them invest uh, in the vaccine development um, with you know, individual orders, probably for much smaller size, uh, they would never have made or be able to make even uh, the type of investment that they did and that um, that got uh, two approved vaccines and at the end of this week, probably three approved vaccines uh, for the EU uh, on, on on the shelf. So uh, I, I think it's 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 that um, recognition of shared. And need and shared interests or shared thread, 
and a recognition that uh, joint action uh, gets a better, a faster, and probably also a cheaper uh, result. Now, um, member states differ, um, have sometimes different views. Um, there's uh, not a week that passes in the EU where there is not a good debate about something. Now, is that bad? No, it isn't. I don't think so. Um, as long as it doesn't paralyze um, uh, the work, it as long as it doesn't paralyze decisions. So sometimes debates are tough. And um, last year about the budget, it was a tough debate. And um, the same um, is, is true with uh, um, that there's different approaches, particularly uh, Hungary has decided to purchase a, a different vaccine on its own. It's entitled to do so. It, uh, as I said earlier, uh, in the EU treaty, public health is the member state responsibility and not the EU, uh, unless the EU member states decide differently, but, but it is perfectly uh, the right for, for Hungary to purchase a different vaccine than the ones approved by the, the, the European Medi Medicine Agency. It's one handicap, at least, uh, this vaccine uh, cannot be uh, used elsewhere than uh, Hungary, and uh, you can't uh, can't enter the internal market. Um, the question is also: uh, Do people trust a vaccine that has not been approved by the European Medicine Agency? I don't know, uh, but it's a question that will come up uh, in in people's mind uh, probably. So, in other words, uh, one can have their own approach, but there are drawbacks elsewhere. So, at the end of the day, um, I do believe that uh, the EU methodology, the EU approach, uh, has been powerful in the past year. I think we have had successive decisions uh, taken by the EU collectively um, despite all the pressures back home, political, economic, social, collective decisions taken collectively um, using the common methodology uh, of the EU uh, the way to, uh, as a way to answer your, your, the problems back, back in the member state. And uh, so the track record over the past year has been, has been I think, pretty good. Okay, um, thank you, Ambassador. And now we're going to move on to the next batch. For the first question, we have Fitri from FPCA Chapter, General Sudirman. Fitri, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Ray and Mr. Ambassador for the opportunity. So I want to ask some question. Uh, as we know that uh, migrant crisis has become one of European Union issues, I think that the pandemic will have a great impact uh, to those migrant or refugees or asylum seekers in the European Union uh, states. So what I want to ask is, is there any specific regulation that has been established by the European Union related to recovery plan of COVID-19 or the vaccine access towards, towards people that live in migrant camps? Thank you. Thank you, Fitri. Next, we have Latifah Rashid from Universitas Hasanuddin. Latifah. Okay, thank you for the chance. I want to ask a question from, uh, I'm from UNHAS for Mr. Ambassador. Uh, as we know, uh, nowadays, the, the mobility of people who go to work uh, is restricted due to COVID-19. And there are some companies uh, um, are for First, uh, are forced to imply, uh, implement the work from home um, regulations. Uh, my question is that how uh, would you project the continuation uh, for further implementation of the work from home in the European Union, uh, Union be it from the government uh, and the private sector it itself? Thank you. Thank you. And we have one question uh, in the chat box. It's from Yuda. Uh, the social distancing has affected mental health of many. However, mental health issues remain overlooked, especially by government of Indonesia. 
what is your take and the European Union take on the mental health issues and how to combat that? Thank you, and the ambassador, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, th thank you. Interesting um, question. Um, the first question from, if I got it well, um, Fitri from uh, Hassanuddin University in, in Makassar. Um, The uh, was about the uh, vaccination of, of migrant uh, workers and uh, um, and uh, and also of the of refugee in, in refugee camps, if I understood it well. Um, now, certainly, uh, we will. Um, um, there is two important principles in the um, vaccination strategy: is that it, equitability and uh, uh, all um, among the um, uh, EU citizens and uh, the, the uh, <coughs> um, foreign residents in Europe, um, no dis dis distinction between them. And, uh, and secondly, a very particular emphasis, it's, it's been repeated in several um, policy papers, and I think our, um, our president, um, spoke about it uh, two days ago uh, is about the uh, the need to take care of the um, uh, those refugees and uh, who are in um, in in the in the uh, various migrant camps uh, in in the eu they they will be taken care of for sure um, for two reasons a humane uh, humanitarian humane reasons um, and B, it's, it's our self-interest um, uh, to treat everybody equally and equitably uh, because, as I said earlier on, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And uh, it makes no difference if you're a man or a woman or um, 80 or 18 years old or <coughs> EU national or, or uh, foreign student from, from Indonesia. Uh, everybody needs to be safe for everybody else to be safe. So, um, and it comes down to the fact that this is a global crisis uh, that cannot be solved on your own uh, turf, even if the EU turf is rather large. But still, we are small if it comes to a global problem uh, like this one. Everybody is small and we need everybody else uh, to address it. <coughs> um, work from home in, in the future. <laughs> I think you, you, you ask a very, very good question there. Um, I think that many people have discovered that um, for a number of things, we would leave the home for nothing, for nothing much. Um, um, I've heard people in Europe uh, speak about um, you know, the number of business trips they made um, and in the past, and now they do the same business, more or less, uh, from their sitting at home um, or maybe sitting in the office but not traveling uh, but communicating also with virtual means and so on so um, they don't dislike that uh, necessarily and uh, so I do think that um, the crisis um, uh, will uh, lead to a change of uh, in habits um, uh, that is there to stay for government as well as for, for, for businesses. And, uh, um, and uh, we have discovered that for certain things, we, we can perfectly well manage um, the, uh, uh, through virtual means. Take this, this video link uh, as an example. Um, if I look at it from my own point of view, then yes, I miss the personal contact and the being able to see everybody in the eye in, in the meeting room and 
and go around the room and 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 and, and see uh, if my audience <laughs> is interested or not. That's that's more difficult uh, than um, now with virtual means. But at the end of the day, I do think we have a um, hopefully. You tell don't need to tell me, but tell uh, uh, tell uh, tell uh, the, the FPCI. <laughs> Uh, colleagues, um, we, we, don't, we do have a, a good one and a half hour with each other, and I hope that we uh, we learn each other, something from from one another. Uh, I learned something from you, and I hope you have picked up a little bit <laughs> from what I said. So, you know, some things can be done virtually, and we will probably continue uh, doing this. So, in my work, we have had. Uh, um, of course, we have many bilateral meetings between the EU and Indonesia, with the foreign ministry, with the trade ministry, with others, and um, now they are virtually. And um, I do think that some matters are better discussed in person, um, uh, you know, for the personal contact and for the ability uh, uh, to step outside with one interlocutor and, and discuss something in private. and. and you know, see, discover, discuss things, margins of maneuver that uh, your uh, interlocutor cannot reveal in, in the meeting room uh, in the plenary. Um, so that that is that that, I, that is true. That, that, but many meetings are perfectly well run uh, in in this format. So, and that I think will go on. I think we will. I will see. Fewer visits coming in from from uh, from from Europe uh, in the future, and, and I also expect the same is true will be true from the Indonesian side. So, some th things will will no doubt um, <coughs> stay. Um, but and um, mental health, um, I I couldn't catch the name of the the student who asked the question, but um, I th I think it's. Why do we want to go back to work? Uh, why do we want to go back to the office and, or to the lecture hall or to the university library? Um, it is uh, to meet with your fellows and, and uh, to have these little, you know, social contacts, a uh, uh, little chat here or um, uh, um, about something serious about the paper yeah, you're writing or about uh, uh, nothing serious at all. Uh, or about uh, as serious a matter as uh, as as, uh, as football or um, or field hockey. Um, um, so that is the sort of thing we need for our uh, for for our daily lives. We are social beings, and and as a social being, we want these contacts. And if we lack them. Um, too much for too long, then of course it has mental health problems, uh, or at least impacts, and people get a bit depressed. And I sometimes see that among my staff um, who work from home, and um, and uh, so there is you have to uh, work on that as an individual, but also as a manager. So. Um, um, and, uh, and the, for the policymaker, is this a vital matter? And I think the drive for us to, uh, to resolve this, this, this crisis is very much because people aren't happy uh, living uh, under constraints at home uh, with a degree of fear and um, uh, with fewer contacts, less diverse contacts than they had, uh, have normally and so on. Um, so I think uh, your question is very right, and it is certainly for the policymaker in, in Indonesia as well as uh, in Europe, it, it's an important factor to take into account. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. And for the next batch, we have two questions from the chat box and one uh, from Anissa Pileni from Universitas Hasanudin. Anissa, you can ask your questions. Thank you again for the opportunity, Ms. Uh, Mr. Harry. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, so uh, my question is actually related uh, towards my uh, towards the previous question coming from Latifa. It's about the working from home settings. Now, as your as from your personal and professional experience during this um, course of more than 
more than six months of um, working from home, do you think uh, was it was it more effective for you to um, engage in bilateral um, conversations or like bilateral bilateral um, bilateral conversations when it when it comes to virtual meeting, or do you think that it it is it is still much better to actually conduct it um, in person since uh, well. Not every nation is going. Not every nation is going to have the same um, same recovery rate as your as the European Union. So I think uh, even for it times ahead, it will be uh, there will be much more meetings conducted virtually. So do you think it's going to be? Um, what is your what is your um, what is your projection into that? And do you think that it's going to be conducted um, still? It's, it's it's going to be still conducted in this way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anissa. And for the second one, we have Marfa from Binus. Would equal distributions of vaccines between the EU member states give its member more vaccine than a predetermined pre quota? Because as we know, more vaccine would be vital as a contingency plan against future COVID cases. Or will these nations only gain vaccines under a set quota? That's a question from Marfa uh, from Binus University. And for the third one, we have Dick, um, Dixon Novenus from Venus as well. Countries have reserved huge amount of vaccine doses, and some people have related it to the concept of vaccine, vaccines nationalism. If I may ask, what do you think about vaccine nationalism itself and the disadvantages of it? Is there any way that we could prevent that? So the ambassador. <clears throat> um, the first question from uh, Anisan from uh, Unhas. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I touched on some aspects in, in, in the previous round, but um, I think one, one observation or one experience has been that uh, um, <clears throat> uh, for our um, public diplomacy work, um, we have become a lot more clever uh, in the use of um, uh, the virtual media and social media uh, than we were before. And as a result, um, the projects that we did um, drew a lot more audience uh, than when we did them in physical mode more audience in terms of numbers, more diverse audience in terms of where people come from, uh, socially, professionally, and geographically. Um, we did a lot of um, activities um, involving, like we do today, um, organizations and individuals from other parts of uh, the uh, the, the country then created Jakarta and or the other big urban centers. And uh, I think that's been an extremely positive experience. And it's good for, for us to bring the, uh, something of the EU, a little bit of a message or a project or activity uh, to parts of the country where otherwise you would never reach out to. Um, so that is a very good thing, and then we will continue to do that, uh, having realized that. Um, <clears throat> other thing, uh, effectiveness. Um, I think we've had more meetings, official meetings, than we otherwise might have had. And that's maybe a silly, silly observation, but it is true that the logistics involved in a bilateral meeting involving Jakarta and Brussels, the capital of Europe, um, in virtual mode is a lot less, a lot easier than if you have to fly people, you know, 11,000 kilometers uh, across the globe. And, uh, and, you can, so there have been more meetings, 
and meetings that involved more people. Um, in the virtual mode, it was much easier for both sides to bring in um, different experts beyond the typical foreign policy people like myself and uh, involve experts from different ministries, different departments and so on that otherwise you would not have had in the meeting had it been physical because people can't travel that much. Uh, so I think that uh, we have had um, on the, in, in a many, uh, quite a few respects, uh, had a, a positive experience about the, the efficiency and the effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> now, what does that mean for our recovery? Um, I think that uh, it does mean that society, societies, let's say, are able to find solutions to problems um, that we before we didn't consider possible. And we, we find ways forward in the face of adversity um, with technology uh, that we hadn't had not tried before. So it means that uh, our recovery uh, will be helped uh, by new ways of doing, by new products that have been created for this reason, region, uh, reason. And, um, and we will benefit from that. Now, at the same time, let's come back a little bit to the, uh, what I said in the early question about us being social beings, humans are social beings. We want to talk, we want to meet, we want to see each other. Uh, you want to put on a nice uh, batik shirt and um, and um, so some things will never change I think and we will want you know as, as Europeans um, I'm from the Netherlands, Belanda um, beautiful country but the weather is not always so good so we will want to go down to the south of Europe for our summer holiday, uh, European summer and uh, and that will, um, with work from home, work from office, um, um, that will still be the same. And uh, so in that sense, uh, human beings will um, continue to be uh, want what they normally do. Um, um, the question from the, uh, the colleague from the Business University, I didn't catch his name, I'm sorry. Um, um, <clears throat> um, you're asking something that I think for now has not been fully decided. Um, so I, I should say that. Um, but uh, I th in general, our policy is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible in Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, that is the goal uh, that, according to us and to our ex experts and other experts, WHO, will get us fastest out of this pandemic. We'll get enough people throughout the world vaccinated to create this uh, herd immunity. So now, if you have that goal, then keeping things in reserve doesn't make sense. Um, so um, I anticipate that, okay, a little bit of a reserve, fine. Uh, but as a policy, I don't think so. Um, uh, because it would work against the global goal of getting people vaccinated globally as quickly as possible. And um, we can also anticipate that the uh, supply chains for vaccines will get better and better, more diverse, uh, faster. Um, we see um, uh, starting problems right now, evidently, uh, but at some point in time, there will be just a, a machinery there um, that can produce however much is needed very quickly. So also in that, uh, against that circumstance, I don't think that 
creating large stocks of vaccines makes sense. And, um, and um, we should continue to focus on vaccinating as many people as we can, as quickly as we can. Um, this last question from the other colleague from Binus, um, <coughs> vaccine nationalism. Yes, I've seen it and I read a lot about it. Um, but I, and I'm not going to comment you know, so much, but I will say that um, it is against our EU approach. Um, it's not part of our EU approach uh, at all. Uh, we have a, of course, we take care of our citizens. We have to uh, on the European continent. Uh, but we have an absolutely multilateral outlook and um, uh, for which we make major contributions, you know, a billion US dollars uh, for COVAX, 50% you know, of COVAX funds it comes from the EU, from the EU taxpayer. Um, and uh, so that I think in itself is, is proof enough, the 38 billion um, euros of grant aid uh, to uh, third countries, to part countries, untied grant aid. So no conditions except uh, condition of use the money in the, in the best possible way um, <clears throat> is, I think, sufficient evidence that vaccine nationalism it goes against our grain. And um, um, we have to be modest uh, in a pandemic like this. Um, uh, we have to recognize that, you know, however big you are, the EU is big, 470 million people, 20% of the world economy, um, as big as the US, as big as China. Um, we are big, but in a problem like this, we are still small uh, because we can't do it alone. And so and that sort of reflection that you are um, one part of the, of the chain, a larger chain, a realization, a recognition of that, I think that is vital for finding a solution to this, uh, to this pandemic. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. And now for the last batch, uh, we're going to take another three questions from the students. And first, we already have one question from Akmal from FPCI General Sudirman. So his question would be how the EU as one of these supranational regional organizations can be an example for other regional organizations such as ASEAN in changing their views towards international cooperations in which during the pandemic period, since its member states countries tend to be more individualistic. That's a question from Akmal from General Sudirman. And second, uh, we have questions from Sofia Marcella from Universitas Hasanuddin. Sofia, the force is yours. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. So my question is, one of the challenge that vaccination program faces in Indonesia is the reluctance or even mere rejection from its society to be vaccinated. How is the situation compared in European nation? And if there's a group of society who rejects the vaccination, how's the EU responding to that? That's my question, thank you. Next, we have Belinda from Minus University. Okay. Um, hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Belinda. I would like to ask again uh, about what is the 2021 plan of uh, from the European Union in the G2021 summit? Thank you. And that will be our last questions. Now, Ambassador, your force is yours. 
Thank you. Um, question from um, Almal. I hope I pronounce your name correctly about the EU being a potential possible model or example. <laughs> you know, um, every region, every country is unique and it's um, very, very difficult to say that, you know, what has worked in Europe for the past uh, 70 years um, uh, can work um, in elsewhere, Asia, ASEAN. Um, so um, very, very difficult to say that. I, uh, what we do often do, of course, is share uh, knowledge, know-how, uh, what we do with others. And ASEAN is a very prominent partner for doing that, and uh, so and help ASEAN develop in its own way. Um, each organization has its own membership uh, with with their typical or characteristic uh, constitutional and historical backdrops. So. Um, Convergence between countries is, is slow, uh, it takes time. So you can't assume that the pace um, that was realized in, for instance, the EU can be the same pace uh, in ASEAN or in Mercosur. Um, but so all sorts of qualifications and notes of caution um, before I do say that, of course, ASEAN and the EU in particular, we feel very like-minded uh, in many respects. And if you look at the, the founding treaty of uh, ASEAN and, um, and um, <coughs> uh, the treaty of the EU, then you see very similar things. Um, a little bit of the structure of ASEAN was inspired by how the EU has organized it um, uh, back in Europe. So in that sense, we do feel very close to ASEAN. We um, have a very good partnership, a, a partnership that um, has, has evolved strongly. And most recently, it did so in, in December, in early December, when the two organizations uh, decided to uh, become what is called strategic partners, uh, which means that elevating your partnership to a higher level, if not the highest level possible. Uh, so uh, that I think shows very well uh, what we, how we see each other, that we are committed and that we are keen to work together not just for the mutual uh, reinforcement of what we do in each of our regions, but also that we are keen to work together to deal with, with global um, issues or regional issues. And COVID is one of them. Um, in December, uh, we had, I think, an absolutely unique seminar between uh, the, um, the medical authorities of the EU and EU member states and their counterparts from the 10 ASEAN countries and the ASEAN Secretariat to talk about COVID. How did you do this? And how, what did you do there? And uh, how shall we do the following? And so very practical, very open. So I think it shows that uh, we're willing uh, to go further on that road of, um, of sharing know-how, sharing knowledge, and seeing how the two together uh, can do a better job than each of us um, individually. <clears throat> the question from Sophia, uh, from Unhad. Um, um, yeah, um, reservations against vaccination. Yes, some people don't want it. Uh, uh, some people are a little bit worried, a bit concerned, a bit scared. 
Um, now, some people don't want it for principal reasons, and religious reasons. Um, our attitude is to respect um, the choices of people. Um, for that is how we do that. Uh, at the same time, uh, to try and convince people who are um, willing in principle to take a vaccine, but are just concerned about whatever, to explain uh, why it is needed, why it is good, and why it is safe. And uh, safety of a vaccine is paramount for us. We take our time approving a vaccine and we do our work well. The European Medical Agency, top class people, and they know that the decisions that they make are valid for 27 member states, 470 million people. So they can't afford sloppy work. They can't afford uh, mistakes uh, uh, through negligence or similar. So um, safety, communication, awareness raising, and honesty uh, towards your um, citizens, I think is, is, is paramount for getting the, the right level of acceptance of, uh, of the vaccination policy. Um, the last question from uh, Belinda from Binus. Uh, I don't know <laughs> the answer to your question about the summit uh, 2021. Um, what, what will be on the agenda now? Uh, you can guess, uh, more or less, deduct from the reality now. Of course, COVID, post COVID, uh, will be one topic. Post COVID re recovery, uh, economic, social will be a topic. Um, the green agenda, the climate, uh, will be for sure uh, a, a topic. Um, uh, uh, so, um, you know, those are the three uh, evident topics that uh, we, well, that I can anticipate, but it's too early to uh, um, to uh, have a, a few of you uh, on the agenda right now. Okay, colleagues, I have to go. I have something else coming up. I'm very sorry. And, uh, but at four o'clock, I have another talk to give. But I would like to thank you, if you if you allow me, uh, uh, Ranaldi, um, yes, just to th thank you very, very, very much uh, for this afternoon's discussion. I, I hope it was useful for you. It was in interesting for me and useful. Yes, Be we are very grateful to have you in our ambassador lecture and we will uh, we cannot wait for the next numbers of lectures throughout 2021. And hello from me, from Dino Jalal to everybody. Hi, hi, students, right? And I was listening from the sideways, but thank you for the excellent lecture, Vincent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. Okay. All and, the best to everybody. Yes, and with that, we have come to an end of our ambassador lecture. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. And on behalf of FPCI and the audience here today, I would like to extend our gratitude to you and also the delegations of the European Union to Indonesia, and as well as the, all the students who have joined us today. Thank you, everyone. And I hope uh, for your telephone talk provoking questions. We hope to see you in future events. Thank you. Let's give, uh, let's give us a big hand of applause to Ambassador. Thank you. See you soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, semuanya yang udah join. Um, yes, thank you for for all the questions you guys. Udah uh, apa namanya uh, stay sampai akhir.